Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another of these lockdown chats where I look over my back catalogue from the last few months, uh, take a look at some of the thinkers and theories and subjects I've explored on then and now, and see if they can offer us any significant insights into what's currently going on in the world um, at this time, the pandemic in particular. Um, today I'm going to look at romanticism, a topic I covered uh, maybe a few months ago, so if you haven't seen that video, uh, maybe go and take a look now because this will probably make a lot more sense if you do. Um, but I'm going to do a quick overview anyway. So what is or what was Romanticism? <clears throat> the Romantics were a group of thinkers that lived from, from around 1750 uh, to 1830. The, they were a diverse bunch that included the English poets, people like Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, uh, the German Romantic philosophers, people like Schelling and Schlegel, um, and political thinkers like Rousseau. <clears throat> and while they're difficult to pin down, there is a, a, a common thread that runs through them um, that usually idealises nature uh, man's place in nature, man's natural harmonious place in, in, within the natural world, um, idealises man's feelings and sentiments and emotions, um, and really is a, a recoiling against the cold calculating logic, uh, ever expanding logic of modernity and of industrialization that man has been alienated by these, these things um, and that there is a sense of nostalgia uh, uh, and something we've lost um, from moving out of our place in nature. Um, <clears throat> there are two quotes that we might use as a springboard here. Um, one is Rousseau from The Social Contract which was published I think in 1762 really started the Romantic movement, <coughs> excuse me, um, which argues that man has been alienated um, from his natural place in the world and that uh, modern institutions have corrupted man and man lives uh, harmoniously with himself and with others in a state of nature. And in the famous first lines he says, man is born free but everywhere he is in chains. You know, chains representing uh, the cold and calculating fact of modernity and industrialization and freedom, uh, the representative of the natural condition. Um, we can see a similar sentiment in Wordsworth's The Prelude, where he says, whatever its mission, the soft breeze can come to none more grateful than to me. Escaped from the vast city where I long had pined, a discontented sojourner, now free, free as a bird, to settle where I will. Uh, similarly here we can, we can see Wordsworth's nostalgia for nature and his argument that man is alienated from it by the vast city of modernity, of industrialization. So <clears throat> let's turn now to COVID-19. First of all, I am a bit of a romantic. I've been influenced by them. I think they're an important counterpoint to modernity, to always remember that, that man's feelings and sentiments and emotions and nature is as much a part of the human condition and should be emphasized just as much as reason and, and, and study and calculation and logic. And that sometimes, you know, the, the imperative to detach yourself from yourself um, that modernity commands. Um, it's something that that makes us forget our own uh, our own feelings towards the subject matter, say, and that that is just as important. It's just as important to consider how we feel about something and consider our, our own emotional place in the world uh, as it is to be a cold, calculating uh, scientist, as it were. <clears throat> um, so. You know, I like the romantics. I am, um, in some senses, uh, in some sense, a romantic. Um, but I think COVID nineteen does powerfully remind us of the limitations of the romantic position of the idealizing of nature. COVID nineteen reminds us that 
nature can be dangerous and inhospitable and a horrible thing as much as it can be beautiful and harmonious and awe-inspiring um, that mankind has actually spent millennia trying to get away from nature um, that that culture and reason and, in, and industrial life is something that has transcended nature we've done we, we've spent millennia trying to we've spent millennia building how roofs and houses and heating and improving technology and bridges um, and all the rest of it and all these things really are are man moving away from nature um, putting culture uh, front and center of the human condition um, and leaving nature uh, in the dust so you know it's very easy to be nostalgic about man's natural place in the world but we mustn't forget you know it's much more difficult to be nostalgic to be to idealize and romanticize technology say um, when these two things when they it's obviously just as important but these two things often live in synthesis with each other. It's important for us to be uh, natural and to think about our own natural place in the world whilst also contemplating on the benefits of, of culture and industry uh, and technology. So, you know, COVID-19 reminds us that nature is sometimes something to be escaped from and, and, and transcended and that really in antithesis to Rousseau, Nature can be a Hobbesian one. Um, uh, life in a state of nature can be nasty, brutish, and short. Um, and so human reason is something that should be prioritized more than the natural condition of man. Um, you know, for Hobbes, people like Hobbes and Descartes, people that the Romantics were rallying against, it was that center point of reason, that logical zero, one point that the human was capable um, of, of, of creating himself um, as apart from the natural world, something that Kant also argued that was most important. And that side of the Enlightenment uh, really did win and has brought us all these incredible innovations and, and technical advances. And I think, um, again, COVID-19 can remind us of this. So where the romantics remind us that we are alienated from nature and we should return to it in some ways. The current pandemic um, um, can remind us of, of the, the, the problems of that position. Um, so I think you can see this problem, this tension in the global warming debate. And we have to remember that we have inherited a lot from these two traditions, the tradition of the Enlightenment and the tradition of Romanticism that, sits, uh, that sit in parallel with each other, and that we are all in some way uh, um, modernists, rationalists, and romantics. Um, and I think the global warming argument um, these things are baked into it, but in the global warming argument, it's framed as a romantic argument often that we should return to nature, that we should go backwards, um, that we should live, uh, you know, more within our means and more how nature intended us. And I, and I, I agree with this. I think I'm not trying to revise that argument in any way, but I'm saying that in the way that we think about these things, the way that we argue, we have to remember that innovation and industry and technology has done just as much to help us as living with our means. And there are all these wonderful innovations um, that will help with uh, uh, global warming, obvious things like solar power and electric cars um, that will improve uh, our position in the world just as much as living within our means. And you can see the necessity you know, this can seem a bit abstract and so what, but you can see the necessity in thinking like this, I think, in the fact that a billion people in the world still live in poverty. For them, unfortunately, industrialization and burning fossil fuels is still essential. For them, it's a life and death choice. So there is a problem 
in a way, in us in the West framing the entire narrative of going backwards when some countries do have to combine the forward march of modernity and industrialization with uh, their, 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 their combating of global warming. Um, for example, South Asia, um, as the number of people living in extreme poverty decreased by 30% in that same period, the amount of carbon dioxide increased by 204%. Um, it's very, very difficult to improve uh, uh, the well-being of a country without, born it, without burning fossil fuels at the moment, unfortunately. So all I'm saying that is that romanticizing the idea of going backwards and living with our own means uh, might not shine a light on other important things like research and development funding, uh, really pouring a lot of energy and effort into technology and working with countries that have to develop um, and not, you know, scapegoating countries like India for continuing to burn fossil fuels, working with them um, in order to combine modernity and romanticism in a way that can be helpful. Um, that's interesting, I think. Um, so we can see this tension a bit more, actually. This tension um, the, the between nature being something to idealize and nature being something to, that we can never quite get a grasp on, that we can't live harmoniously with. In the second wave of the Romantics, the first wave being people like uh, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, I'm talking specifically about the English Romantics here. And the second wave being people like Byron and Shelley. Um, and in the first wave, that romanticizing, that idealizing of nature is a central theme, an obvious central theme. So we can take, for example, Coleridge in the dungeon where he says, with other ministrations thou, O nature, healest thy wandering and distempered child, thy pourest on him thy soft influences, thy sunny hues, fair forms and breathing sweets, thy melodies of woods and winds and waters, till he relent and can no more endure to be a jarring and a dissonant thing. Um, talking here about nature's ability to heal um, mankind's problematic, uh, problematic behaviours and that it's nature that can help us rather than, than things like dungeons and dungeon. The dungeon that Coleridge is talking about can be thought more metaphorically uh, of modernity in general. And similarly, in Wordsworth's lines written in early spring, he says, the budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air, and I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. If this belief from heaven be sent, if such by be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? And again here, nature, beautiful, transcendent, uh, something to be adored, uh, and what has man made of man, something to be uh, lamented. So. There is no complicated relationship with nature in the early Romantics. But in the second wave, from people like Byron and Shelley, there is a much more complicated, uh, a much more tension-ridden relationship with it. So I'll talk just about Shelley briefly today. And I think he has the kind of uh, um, attitude um, towards nature and modernity and, and harmony um, that I think it is best is better to emulate than the early romantics, a much more reasonable one, a much more uh, realistic one to our own modern sensibilities. Um, so into a skylark, like a, a quite a long poem that I won't read all of, he says, He's talking about the skylark, a, a, a European bird that only sings uh, when it's high in the sky, too high for human ears to hear it. So in it, he's talking about the skylark being something that the human, a natural thing that the human can't quite grasp, can't quite hear. It's a beautiful song um, that the human, uh, that human ears are unable to detect. Um, so he says, 
What thou art we not know, we know not. What is most like thee, teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell the saddest thought. So again, yeah, you can see a much more complicated relationship with an ideal place in the world uh, with Shelley. He can kind of see it and he can grasp it and he can dream after it. But when it comes to attaining it, we have a problem. Um, and it, there's always a sort of grabbing for it and then re realizing our own uh, limitations. Um, there's a similar theme in uh, Osmandius by Shelley, which goes, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, in the sand, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and, and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor read those passions well, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless, lifeless, thing, lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, and on the pedestal, these words appear. Here lies Osamandius, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains around this colossal wreck, barren and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Um, here we can see the theme of human greatness, human culture, human reason crumbling at the hands of nature. Both are limited. The natural world takes over inevitably in the end, um, time being a natural destroyer. It talks about the harshness of nature, the dry desert, um, and that harmony and synthesis with nature is impossible, but it's something that can still be, I think, just grasped and touched and dreamed of in Shelley. So I do like this attitude towards nature. Uh, slightly more than the early romantics. Okay, what do you think? Let me know in the comments. Do you think the romantics had the right disposition towards nature? Uh, do you think the later romantics uh, had a more realistic conception of it? Do you think the current pandemic will make us reevaluate our attitude towards the natural world? And do you think that the global warming debate is framed in the right way? Could it be framed more effectively to convince more people. Let me know in the comments. Please do uh, subscribe, like and share. Remember to hit that bell once you press subscribe. It's the best way I have of letting you know uh, that a video has been published. Otherwise it gets lost in the jungle of YouTube. Um, I now have a podcast version where I just take the audio um, of the videos and uh, publish them as a podcast. I will leave links to that in the comments below and in the description below. So please go and review and rate that if you like the channel. Thanks as always to my Patreons who make this possible. I don't charge for these videos, by the way. The Patreons only pay for my main videos, uh, the next of which I think is going to be a sequel to my Shock of Modernity video. And it's called The Fist of Modernity. Um, that should be coming within the next couple of weeks. Um, have a great weekend. I'll see you next time.